Oh, right. Um, this is all very nice and dandy to show these naturalistic scenes, but how do you measure? How do you measure the way that the children are being engaged by those signals out there? This is called neuroethology. Uh, how are they engaged with those things? How can we possibly imagine that we could um, uh, 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 somehow think about this collective, to say two-year-olds watching that scene? So this is what Warren and I have been doing. So if there's something important happens in your, in your world, you're going to try and foveate because then you'll be able to know the details. So this is one viewer, and now you have many, many, many viewers watching that particular frame. And as they come together, uh, you know, we are measuring this in terms of um, how hot those colors are. If it is very red, it's because a lot of people are looking at that particular spot at that particular time, okay? All right, now you remember that they're watching that video, okay? Um, now let's uh, sort of take a, a bird's eye view of that. And now you're gonna have what we call a salience map. And in the salience map, what you have is that the hotter the color, the more people are looking at that spot at that particular moment, okay? Um, now, if I had control of my computer, um, I would be able to stop this for you. Uh, but you see, now you're watching the video through the eyes of 35 two-year-olds. And whenever it gets red, it's because something very special happened at that particular moment, at that particular space, okay? And in this way, we created a distribution of visual resources that the children are dedicating to whatever they are watching. Okay? Moment by moment. Okay. Now, let's move this to the side. Um, and um, we had to create quantification of that. So, um, what we have here are frames of the video. So, this here is time. Okay? This is one frame of video, and this is time. Let's core it out. And what you have now is what we call an attentional funnel. So, over here, for example, uh, uh, people are a little bit dispersed. So they are all over the place. You see it got very red here. It got very red because people all of a sudden start watching that video at that spot exactly the same way. So let's just watch some of that then. So this is a scene. If I could stop you, I will show you moment by moment. But this is 35 typically developing children watching that particular scene. Whenever you get this kind of reddish, you will have an attentional funnel. It, everybody's you know, looking at the same place at the same time. If, for example, Claudia Cardinali, and she's probably dead by now, but, um, um, it, no, she's alive? <laughs> Yay! Uh, anyway, if she, if she appeared, you know, I used to be very fond of her when I was little. Um, so if she appeared in the middle, you know, I would look at her, but everybody would look at her as well, right? But you see what, now, uh, now let's look at here. It starts with this tremendous confluence, you see? Uh, and here is the funnel as it uh, sort of uh, goes moment by moment. Now, why this is important to us? We call this entrainment. Entrainment meaning that of all of those things that the children could do and two-year-olds pay attention to all sorts of things, they are basically spending a lot of time looking at the same place at the same time. In fact, about 80%, 80% of the time that those kids are looking at that videotape, they are doing exactly the same thing. Fish do that, other animals do that. We all, I mean, different species do that because I know God or nature had to create a way of getting species to find adaptive signals over there in the environment. Now, this is what happens in that particular frame, okay? You have the, the normative funnel. These are typical children, and you see what the children of autism are doing here. Uh, the typical children are paying attention to the hot spot, as Andy Meltzer would say, and the children of autism are spending a lot of time looking at the movement of that door. Now, we use this kind of a measure because uh, there's no experiment here. We define the experiments basically on the basis of what the children did because there are many, many, many significant funnels of attention, significant convergence of collective attention in the typical children. And we use those in order to measure then what happens to the children of autism. Here is an example. These are the typical two-year-olds, and here are the two-year-olds of autism. You see exactly what is happening moment by moment. Um, now, this is another one. Oh, they, oh, they do well. <laughs> you know, that's very nice. But what are the children of autism looking at? They are not necessarily looking at that action. You see, they are all over the place here. Okay? So, we took um, that, and we basically creating an individual measure of relative entrainment. What does that mean? It means uh, how much the individual child 
is entrained or engaged relative to our typical norms, okay? And this is what those little balls are. It's divergence of experience. Now remember, this is important for me to tell you, this is a three, four, five minute experiment. But if the children are not paying attention to the same thing that the other children are showing, they are not learning the same thing that the other children are showing. They are not having shared experiences. And the divergences that we see in those little experiments is basically what happens to them all day long in their lives. Okay? Keep that in mind. So we use this measure of relative entrainment, and this is what we found. That this is time one, experiment and outcome measures at the age of two. Uh, it was okay predictive of how autistic they were and is kind of trending in predicting their nonverbal skills or intelligence uh, and language. But this was the exciting part. Now, these outcome measures are now when they are three and a half. It's a year and a half later after the experiment that we did at the age of two. And now we are predicting very well how autistic they are. We are also predicting their cognitive development and we're also predicting their language development. When I came into this field, I thought that the cognitive disability and the language disability were a given in, in autism. And what we're seeing now is that this kind of divergence of experience, the lack, the lack of entrainment in the social world is basically shaping uh, their, um, uh, uh, not only how autistic they're going to be, how intelligent they're going to be and how much language they're going to have. So this is what we're doing, and this is how I'm going to end. The American Academy of Pediatrics, but everywhere in the world, we all know that early intervention works. Basically, we, you know, there's a premium at detecting autism as early as possible, okay? And the reason being that we are now maximizing these children's outcome. And, uh, you know, and now I'm very excited talking about uh, with Sally a little bit early on. I have a feeling that not only we can attenuate autism, we might be able to even prevent autism in some children. This is a 35 to 80 billion dollar cost to, uh, in America anyway, to the, to the society. And we have an opportunity to revert this trend by basically optimizing outcome. And so our goal is to use those kinds of cognitive science methods to um, deploy our science in the community. This is called translational science in high throughput, low cost, um, uh, primary care centers. And our goal, needless to say, it's not only to identify children. Our goal is to do something about it, which basically means that um, if you can detect this condition early on in life, we ought to be able to intervene as well. It's a bioethical imperative. Um, thank you to the families, to the various funding agencies, to the various wonderful people who work in our lab and make possible this kind of work, uh, including the folks who work with us in engineering. Um, I also need to thank my, uh, my colleagues um, who helped us see the children and characterize the children. Thank you very much.